Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be with you all. Oh, wow, I can see everyone now. That's exciting. Um, it's fabulous to be with you all. It's, um, it's such a joy to join two churches together on a day like Good Friday where we're united by the cross. Thank you on behalf of all of Ruach who are here, Hayward Youth Baptist Church, for having us. Um, we're so grateful. Um, it's so lovely to be with you all, and it's a sin to be envious, and we're not at all envious of your building. Um, <laughs> Just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> um, but I wanted to start with a question, which is going to sound like a very obvious question for lots of you in the room. And the question is, do you know Jesus? Yes. And lots of you will answer yes. When I first became a Christian, I was 11. Um, and I went into school and I began to ask people, do you know Jesus? And I got saved and I was full of the love of Christ. And I, I was so excited. And I'd go up to my friends and say, do you know Jesus? And they'd be like, um, yes, no, I kind of go to church, and I'd say, going to church isn't enough. You need a relationship with him because he loves you. And they would look at me very strangely. Um, and I was very passionate about Christ. The other time that question is asked, do you know Jesus, is when I'm out with my good friend Emma, who I can talk about because she's not here, and she spots a relatively attractive man who might be a suitable match for me, and she'll say, Jess, let's go and ask him, do you know Jesus? <laughs> at which I run away. <laughs> Or perhaps in precious discussions with someone, I don't know whether you've had them, and someone might ask why you are how you are, and you might say, it's because I know Jesus. The very beginning of this month of April marked 18 years since I gave my life to Jesus. I think that means I'm now some form of Christian adult, um, contrary to popular belief. Um, and most of my life since has been getting to know him. And I could now stand and I would say, quite confidently say, that I, I know Jesus. Um, and I've got to know him by his word, and I've got to know him through people, and I've got to know him through the church, and I've got to know him in quiet, still moments, and I've got to know him through trials and pain, and I've got to know him in stillness. And I remember when I first heard the words in the video that we're about to listen to, um, these words are spoken, you might have heard them before, by an African-American pastor in a Baptist church um, called S.M. Lockridge. And here he asked the question, do you know him? We're going to listen to that video now and we're going to carry on. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age, he rewards the diligent, and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, he 
His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And His yoke is easy. And His burden is light. I wish I could describe Him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You see, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah. I thought about summing that video up and I thought, no, I think I have to play it. Um, and at the end of that, when I've listened to that, I go, yes, that's the Jesus I've come to know. And I can't claim to understand or to fully grasp him in his fullness, but it resonates with me. And my heart is moved by those words because I know them to be true. And when I started preparing for this message, I did not question the fact that I knew Jesus. I, um, I might have been proud enough to think that 18 years into my walk with him, one theology degree under my belt and another one in progress, that I was doing well at this knowing Jesus thing. And the thing is, I did know him as victorious and as mighty and as friend and as healer and as the only one who qualified to be an all-sufficient saviour and the fundamental doctrine of true theology. And I've listened to that video a lot of times. I could keep going. And I thought, yeah, I know Jesus. And then I started to prepare for this sermon, and I went, to, um, I went to Isaiah 53 and thought, I'll do a nice theological expounding of Isaiah 53. And then I read Matthew 26 and Matthew 27 out loud in my kitchen, and it undid me totally. The account of Jesus' last night with his friends, as we just heard in prayer, betrayal, and denial and arrests, and he was beaten and mocked and spat on and tortured and stripped and hung on a cross to die. And I've read it so many times, and I know it as a story, and then I ask myself, do I know that Jesus? The Apostle Paul says this of Jesus in Philippians 2, verse 6. I've just realised, Ben, that I don't know. Oh, look at that. He's so good. The Apostle Paul says, "...who being in the very nature of God, that's Christ did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I wonder if that verse 7 hit you as much as it hit me. He made himself nothing. The king that we speak of the king in that video, the king of the universe, made himself nothing. And so I ask myself, do I know him? Do I know that Jesus? Not just the king, not just mighty, resurrected and victorious, not just the healer, not just my friend. Do I know the Jesus that made himself nothing? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read three different sections of Matthew's account of Maundy, Thur Maund Maundy Thursday and Good Friday as we look at this king who made himself nothing, who suffered and who died. Jesus, God, suffered. God died. And so after the Last Supper, where Jesus predicts Peter's denial and, and Judas's betrayal, and after he's broken bread and said, this is my body, and after he's poured out wine and said, this is my blood, and after he's invited his friends to eat of it and to drink of it, the king of the universe stoops low, to wash the feet of his friends. And then he goes to pray. Starting in Matthew 26, verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, where he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here 
and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Up until this point in in scripture, Jesus has spoken about his death. He said that he's going to be crucified, but he's been almost quite strangely matter-of-fact about it. And now we're faced with this altogether different picture. You'll know if you read other accounts that it said that his drops of his sweat was like drops of blood. Jesus' suffering is really beginning here. And he falls with his face to the ground and he's overwhelmed by sorrow and pain. And when Jesus asks if it's possible for the cup to be taken from him, what he's really asking is, God, is it possible that your wrath can be taken from me? Is it possible that your judgment can be taken from me? In the Old Testament, the cup was familiar. The cup represented the wrath and the judgment of Almighty God. And so what Jesus was facing as he fell with his face to the ground in Gethsemane was not just the physical pain of crucifixion, but the wrath of God, the judgment of God on sin poured out on Jesus. The one who knew no sin was about to become sin. I actually can't get my head around that. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. God, the king of the universe, the king of the ages, became sin. And when Jesus prayed, not my will but yours be done, he actually started to change the trajectory of human history of the human race. Let's cast our mind right back to the Garden of Eden, where God made man and woman and they walked together. And one day, really what humans said is they said, hey God, not your will but mine. Not your will but mine. God said, don't do that. And they said, but we want to be like him. Not your will, God, but my will. And there began our separation and our alienation from God and this deep chasm of darkness between the human race and their creator. And the story of human history is that we've said, yeah, we can do it on our own. We can do it our way. And the story of Eden to Gethsemane is man in us, our sin and our pride and our humanness, saying, not your will, God, but mine, until this moment where Jesus said, not as I will, but as you will. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, 700 odd years before Christ was even born, the prophet Isaiah says this. He says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What Jesus was facing wasn't just physical pain. It was the iniquity of us all. I think there's probably enough iniquity in this room to be painful. Probably enough iniquity in the whole of the United Kingdom. Probably enough iniquity across the whole world for all time, for all people from the beginning of time to the end. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We turn to our own way. And in turning to our own way, we turned away from God. And God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so following Gethsemane, we have Jesus betrayed into the hands of the Romans by Judas, and he's arrested, and he's led away to be crucified. And before Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, there's one line, I just wanted to pick up on one line in Matthew 26, 56, and it simply says, then all the, all the disciples deserted him and fled, all of his friends. In the hour of his greatest need and his greatest sorrow, those who had walked with him and loved him, and knew him, and walked on water, and fed thousands of people, and seen miracles, and declared him the Christ. You are the Christ. They all left. The God of the universe, in a man, deserted, and betrayed, and denied, by those who knew him, and loved him the most. Do you know that Jesus? Do you know Jesus alone, and betrayed, and denied? Let's pick up the story again on Good Friday in Matthew 27 where Jesus is brought before Pilate, the governor. And beginning at verse 11, 
It says, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew that it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who's called the Messiah, Pilate asked. And they all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This man, Barabbas, he was was a man that was involved in an uprising in the city. He was a murderer and he was in jail. And by all accounts, he was a common lower class kind of criminal. And I want you to imagine him kind of shackled in his cell, waiting for someone to arrive and lead him out to be killed in the most gruesome way that they had to kill someone. Imagine that he said goodbye to his family one day, knowing at some point he's never going to see them again. And from his cell, I imagine what he could hear was the crowd shouting after Pilate had asked, which of the two do you want me to release to you? I imagine he could hear the crowd shouting, Barabbas! And then when Pilate said, and what do you want me to do with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? I imagine he heard crucify him. I imagine what Barabbas heard was his own name and the shouts for crucifixion. And just imagine, in the moment the guard comes to his cell and he starts to gear himself up and he starts to think, okay, it's now. Now's the moment. This is the end of my time on this earth and I am about to die one of the most painful deaths. And he readies himself for that horror. And the guard comes and says, you're free to go. Can you imagine? What? What's what's going on? No, I was... uh, What's happening? And the guard says to him, another man's going to die in your place. Another man is going to die the death made for you. And another man's going to hang on the cross that we made for you. In Isaiah 53, 5... The prophet Isaiah writes, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And to Barabbas, the God might say that Jesus was pierced for his transgressions and crushed for his iniquity, and that the punishment was put on Jesus and that by his wounds you're healed. Barabbas, you're free to go. And I've always wondered whether Barabbas stuck around, whether he stayed. Did he run home from his cell or did he stay? I wonder if he followed the line of people to Calvary. I wonder if he saw the lashings of the whip and the nails driven into his hands and his feet. And I wonder if he stood and he thought, that should have been me. And just imagine the scene that Barabbas goes home to his wife and his children Imagine their faces when he says, I'm home. In my place condemned, Jesus stood. And he was the first man, probably, to ever say, Jesus died.
died for me. And Barabbas was a no one. In fact, the only reason we know anything about Barabbas is because he was the one who died. Uh, He was the one in place of Jesus. Jesus took his death. His death was nothing remarkable. It wasn't uncommon. Um, He'd simply been the criminal alongside Jesus on trial that day. And he would have been forgotten. And Jesus died a nobody's death. He became nothing. And in a sense, we are Barabbas. We said, not your, not your will, but mine. We wanted to be something. We want to be like God. And when Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done, he became nothing. He became a servant. He stood in our place like Barabbas. Jesus died for me. Jesus died in my place. And that he, as God, became like us. He became nothing in our place. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we're healed. I wonder if you know him. And we come now to the crucifixion, beginning at verse 27 of Matthew 27. And there's just one small part I'm going to read first. It says, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. And then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. Back in the Garden of Eden, when man first sinned, when we first sinned, we realized we were naked and we hid away from God in our shame. And he came to us and he shed the blood of an innocent animal to cover our nakedness and our shame. And here, God himself stands naked And he doesn't hide, but he's publicly mocked and shamed and beaten and about to shed his own blood to cover our shame once and for all. I wonder if you know him. Picking it up again at verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusts God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the two rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave out his spirit. He gave up his spirit. And we know that that cry from the other Gospels might have been, it is finished. If at Easter we only see the resurrected Christ, we might forget that God suffered. 
God, creator, God of the universe, coming to earth in the form of a man. We might forget that he suffered. And there's a sentence that has always blown my mind, and it's a two-word sentence. God died. God. We might forget, if we only see the resurrected Christ, that Jesus, who was without sin, cried out and essentially said, God, where are you? Totally sinless, totally holy, totally spotless. And in his suffering, he says, God, where are you? If we forget that God suffered, if we forget that he came so low, that he didn't remain far away on some throne somewhere, but came from heaven to be with us, we might believe that he's far from our suffering. We might mistake his silence for his absence. And we might even think that to suffer means there's something wrong with us. Many of you here are parents. And um, most of you, if you've seen your child in pain, have probably wished that you could take it away. Perhaps that you could experience it instead of them. And you are, of course, powerless to do that. But you can be there. And sometimes we aren't relieved of our pain in this world. And God is with us, even in the silence of our own Good Fridays and Holy Saturdays. And after pain, he promises hope. And where we, and you as parents, could not ever take the suffering of another into your own body, in a sense, that is what Jesus did. And in our pain, he doesn't always give us answers or quick fixes or miracles, but he gives us himself. I think the world at this point is probably very disillusioned with the idea of religion. And it doesn't interest me that much. But a God who comes and gives himself, a God who hangs naked, humiliated, mocked and beaten, and associating himself with the most excruciating part of what it means to be human, that interests me. That's the Jesus that the world needs. He becomes as guilty as us, and in return, we become as innocent as him. Not hiding from the Father anymore like in Eden, but able to look at him once again as our guilt is exchanged for his innocence, as he becomes nothing, becomes a servant, so that we might be raised up with him. And it's here at the cross where God profoundly identifies with the most painful part of what it means to be human, with pain and with loss and with grief and with abandonment and with death. And I think there's something today, about today, that those who have been through the darkest valleys of life will understand. Isaiah describes the Messiah as a man of suffering, familiar with pain. And it's here where I ask myself, do I know that Jesus? Not just as a miracle worker, not just as creator, not just as friend, not just as Jesus, my superhero, though he really is, but as the one who suffered and who became nothing, and who died our death. I think people can say a lot of things about religion, and maybe a lot of things about God, but I don't know anyone that could look at Jesus and who could look at the cross and say God doesn't care, or say he doesn't understand. And the most incredible thing is that God was the only one actually entitled to pour out judgment and wrath on anyone, and he poured it out on himself. When Jesus said... Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What he told us is that true life is accessed through pain. For years, I think, I've longed to be a somebody. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to change the world. (laughs) And yet the call of Christ on my life is that I might become nothing. And that in the giving up of my life, I might truly find life. And in reality, most of our lives don't look like Easter Sunday. The moments of resurrection are interspersed between heartbreaks and loss and pain and suffering and broken relationships and unmet longing. And it's in these places where the Jesus who became nothing, where the one who suffered, offered his life in our place and he meets us there. He meets us in the Gethsemanes of our own lives. He dies our death and he meets us right there in pain. And God's power does not always look like a miracle. Sometimes it looks like the cross. 
And his promise then is that life comes after death. That suffering doesn't have the final word. It means that cancer doesn't have the final word. It means that injustice doesn't have the final word. Poverty doesn't have the final word. Brokenness doesn't have the final word. And even death itself doesn't have the final word. And so Good Friday, this day, today, is an invitation to know that Jesus, the one who suffered, the crucified God, the God who came close, who didn't remain far away on some distant throne demanding that we worship him, but came taking the very form of a servant and made himself nothing. Let's pray. Jesus, we give you praise and we give you worship today. As one who suffered, as one who meets us in our pain, and as one who knows us all together. God, thank you that on Good Friday you come close as we look to the cross. That you associate yourself with the most painful parts of what it means to live on this earth. And you offer us hope in the midst of it. Thank you that you turned a symbol of torture into a symbol of hope. Thank you that you died in our place and for us. Jesus, we love you and we worship you and we give you praise and we give you glory today. In your mighty name. Amen.